128 riders on 193 bikes competed in ages from 7 to 15, and like their more senior counterparts in the open divisions, these youngsters only know two speeds, stop and flat out. With conditions on the dry side, there was no quarter given, and on a lot of occasions, no margin for error, as the competitors strive to prove that they were the best for their age in the state. Craig Anderson from the Lakes Club picked up two titles in the under-12 ADCC category, and Brad Wiseman from West Maitland emulated that feat by winning two crowns in the 708.50cc and automatic modified divisions. West Maitland had a very successful carnival, with Arthur Harvey, Brock Parks and Nathan Anderson also winning titles. The host club Curry grabbed titles, with Daniel Storfer and John Joyce riding well, Mark Peacock from Lakes won the 15 years ADCC class, and Rodney McDonald the 13 to 15 years ADCC modified four-stroke. Even with the ups and downs of the day for some riders, Organisers were over the bumps with the standard of the meeting, and you never know, the next Craig Dack or Stephen Gore may just have been among these young throttle jammers. To be run on September the 21st and 22nd, the conference will try and identify problems experienced by women competitors in each stage of their life cycle, from childhood, adolescence, adulthood and old age, and to identify solutions at a local level. Attracting speakers of the calibre of Robin Leggett and Anne Sargent to name just two, it's another coup for the fledgling Hunter Academy of Sport. In handing over a cheque for $19,000 from the State Government to go towards the conference, Deputy Chair of the Women's Advisory Council, Helen Smith, has her eyes on the future through this Congress. Mostly the long-term goals are to encourage women to continue participating in their sport, either at a playing level, a, an administration or a coaching role. For Academy Executive Officer Ken Clifford, he's hoping support will come from a broad cross-section of the community. Well, we hope we'll get people from all the, uh, the sporting associations in the region to come along and uh, to see the sorts of things that can be available to assist people to continue their involvement in sport. The company controls three important mines in the region, Gretley Colliery at Walls End, the only Newcastle area mine still producing, Pelton Ellalong near Cessnock, which is that area's only mine still operating on the old Greta field, and the large Saxonvale concern. The company also has two mines in the Lithgow area west of Sydney. In all, they represent nine and a half million tonnes of exports. The consortium seeking the spoils is led by the McElraith McGeechan Group, which is 46% controlled by Sir Peter Abel's TNT Limited. The 88 cents a share bid values Oakbridge at about $300 million. McElraith Managing Director Tony Lawrence says the consortium is only seeking to buy the 80% holding in Oakbridge, presently held by Elders Resources NZFP Limited. Elders Resources has already offered 86 cents a share, rising to 90 cents once the compulsory acquisition level is reached. This might look like an ordinary Toyota four-wheel drive, but it's far from it. When it's completed in two weeks, this vehicle will be able to withstand attacks from almost any type of weapon. The entire body of the vehicle has been fitted out with ballistic steel, the same used in armoured trucks. The windscreen and windows are also bullet resistant, while the fuel tank is made of a material called Explosafe, which prevents it from exploding. Even the tyres are protected. If they're penetrated by a bullet, the vehicle can still travel up to 50 kilometres on a flat tyre. Because the windows don't open, the vehicle also includes an intercom, so the driver can speak to anyone outside without leaving the vehicle. Although the owner of the vehicle in Port Moresby wishes to remain anonymous, according to O'Neill's, the $100,000 worth of protection is warranted in a country where violence is an everyday occurrence. A particular area that it's going into, it could be facing uh, shotgun number one, handgun number two, and spears of all things number three. While the local company has provided Papua New Guinea with armoured cars before, this is only the second private vehicle they've had to fit out. But it's a market which the company believes will flourish in the future. We have built other, other armoured cars for the uh, commercial vehicle, but I think you'll find that more and more private uh, people will be uh, ordering armoured cars. 
Although Australia has not experienced violence like that seen in Port Moresby, the company believes foreign diplomats here will soon desire greater protection. It is a coming thing where foreign embassies will, will insist that their uh, diplomats be protected by armoured vehicles, yes. Given that it was a telecast match, it was rather chilly and that many people are involved in their own sports on Saturdays, a crowd of 22,907 was exceptional and to say they enjoyed the win would be the understatement of the year. A standing ovation for a gallant team that wearily trooped off the ISC with heads held high after a magnificent 10-4 win over the Sea Eagles in one of the most bruising encounters of the year. This afternoon, Alan McMahon and coaching coordinator Alan Bell were buried behind closed doors with the players, already planning for the West fixture and giving the Gladiators one more day to get over the bruises. But can they maintain this intensity of recent weeks? The boys are confident we can do the job. It's just uh, we take it one game at a time and approach all the little problems that come along the way. You know, there's, there's still a month and a half before the semis even arrive, so you know, they're, they're a long way off and I think we prefer to concern ourselves with the games at hand. Equal fifth with Penrith and only a point away from the double chance position, every game is vital, especially Wests at Campbelltown. We've got uh, pretty vivid memories of that game last year and I think this week will uh, we'll really test our professionalism and our character again um, to make sure we knuckle down and, and give it the same uh, preparation we had for Manly in the, in the previous eight or nine games. And what the heck, let's go back 48 hours or so to the Knights on show. This is the latest addition to the fleet operated by local firm Elite Limousines. It's just one metre longer than your average Ford sedan, but step inside and you soon see where your $115,000 has been spent. The rear seat is upholstered with luxurious white leather. Timber trims are in rosewood. The car carries appointments you'd normally expect in a Rolls Royce. And at $75 an hour, it may just be affordable for those special occasions. This particular vehicle has a cocktail cabinet, which houses um, about four bottles of champagne, has a TV and video unit, a CD player, AM FM radio, and the leather interior. It also has a small cocktail bar, um, table, and of course it has the CD player, uh, the cellular phone, and intercom built into the same unit. Paul Stevens hopes to paint in this latest design and is set to establish a fleet in Sydney and Brisbane. There's also the prospect of exporting the car to the UK. But with a little imagination, it's easy to see how this mode of transport could become increasingly popular here in the Hunter. So while the car technically has seating for just two in the back and two in the front, you'll find the amount of room inside can be deceiving. John Church, NBN News.
The state government's approval of long wall mining under Taralba and Marmong Point has outraged residents who have fought against it for more than two years. The panels, which extend about two kilometres underground, were the subject of the day inquiry commissioned by the previous Labor government. President of the Bolton Point Marmong Progress Association, Bevan Ramsden, demanded his right to speak on behalf of residents at a cold discussion day at City Hall. I'm not prepared, and I don't believe many residents in the city of Lake Macquarie are prepared to wear damage to their home for the sake of the balance of payments. I don't care a damn about the balance of payments, but I care about my house. Although the Minister Responsible Neil Pickard was unable to attend this forum, the Chief Inspector from the Department of Minerals and Energy, Bruce McKenzie, said that financial concerns were behind the approval of panels 9 and 10 of the FAI Taralba Colliery, even though the government is aware that scores of houses could be damaged. Although Mr McKenzie's job is to advise the Minister on mining operations, he says he had no involvement in this particular long wall proposal. However, he does admit that two years ago he was mine manager at Taralba Colliery, then owned by Pacific Copper, and it was he who originally lodged the application to the state government. But do you believe the right decision was made in granting approval for long walls 9 and 10? Yes, very much so. Even though you were the first one to put in the application from that mine? Yes, very much so. You don't think that, that biases your decision at all? I'm having made the decision and made my evaluation much earlier than perhaps people in the department. Um, I've had a much broader opportunity to look at it from both the management side and from the side of the inspectorate. Do you believe the residents' concerns are warranted? I certainly recognise the concerns of the residents. I can understand their position, yes. The residents believe the government's decision is wrong and say it ignored a recommendation by Lake Macquarie Council to place a moratorium on all long wall mining, as well as up to 200 houses facing possible damage in the area and in Wood Rising Estate. This is the first time in New South Wales that a major rail line will be undermined. The government says a committee will be set up to monitor the effects of the mining operation and liaise with the community. For the residents, though, their fight is far from over, as they plan to take the issue to the Land and Environment Court. Jody McKay for MBN News. In the past, motorcycle training consisted of getting your L plates and hopping on a bike. This complete lack of formal training has been a contributing factor in the number of motorcycle deaths on New South Wales roads. Last year, there were more than 3,600 accidents involving motorbikes, 113 of them fatal. From this week, the 1,000 licence applicants each year in this region will have to undergo a special training course at the Adamstown Driver Training Range. The state government has spent $120,000 upgrading the facility and contracted the Ride It Right group to carry out the courses. Well, we take them from the very basics, from people who have never thrown a leg over a motorcycle before and teach them basic controls, and by the end of the first three and a half hour session we have them so that they can stop, start and change gears on the motorcycle. Under the new scheme, there'll be seven hours of training over two days before being tested for a learner's licence. The subsidised cost of the rider is $40. Between three and six months later, a rider will undertake a further six hours of training at a cost of $60. The courses will not replace the formal RTA testing, which will be carried out now by an examiner following on a bike and not simply standing on the footpath. Roadcraft is also an important part of the training. And an untrained motorcyclist is in danger of 20 times more than a car driver of being involved in an accident. The control skills required to operate a motorcycle are very different from that of any other vehicle on the road. At the moment, Newcastle, Sydney and Armadale are the only rider training centres established. But by 1993, more than 25 training centres like this one will be opened across the state. John Church, NBN News. The Lord Mayor used an address to the Businessmen's Club today to defend once again the Earthquake Relief Fund. 
In the month of July, there was a 27% increase in the number of applications received by the fund. To date, $7.6 million has been donated, of which $1.8 million has been handed out. Half a million dollars in the last 30 days. And that's an increase of 38%. And that trend appears to be exactly what we have predicted, that it takes time for applicants to sort out their needs and to come forward with claims. Frankly, I hope the trend does not continue. But the fact is that six months out from the earthquake, we have had a surge of demand on the fund and the figures show we are demand, managing that demand quickly and efficiently. There was also an admission from the Lord Mayor today that it may have been better to call on the Red Cross or Salvation Army to distribute the funds and that the job of helping people after the quake was far from over. I am not confident, however, that the crisis has passed. I still hear reports of people living in reduced circumstances who have not come forward for assistance. To some extent this was anticipated because Newcastle people are well known for a generosity of spirit that makes them stand back because they assume that there is some, someone worse off than they are. Alderman McNaughton was critical of the Prime Minister and the Premier who both refused to help Council finance the position of fund manager which was filled earlier this year. Council is meeting that cost and is refusing to dip into the relief fund to pay for administration, much of which is being done by volunteers. The Lord Mayor reported that 349 buildings have now been demolished or partly demolished and that earthquake building applications represented more than $62 million work in progress. It was also the first public appearance for the earthquake renewal manager. Brian Easto will earn $107,000 a year for up to three years. Formerly a senior public servant with the Public Works Department in Sydney, Easto's job brief is to coordinate resources, plan residential and commercial development and consult with state and federal governments. I, I think what I can bring to the, to the job is one uh, is some experience in resolving a lot of different complex and often competing interests uh, in a way which makes uh, people happy. I know I've been able to do that in the past and I hope that I can do that here. The image of embroidery is changing. Once seen as merely a cottage craft, needlework is now being used by enthusiasts as a medium for fine art. I think years ago uh, people thought of it as just a craft, but today, I mean, the works now contain painting, mixed media, uh, photographs, and all end up making works of art. The Sydney creative embroiderers have been gaining a reputation for out-of-the-ordinary embroidery since 1973. This exhibition is based on the theme, How Do You Spell Woolloomooloo? and the Sydney stitches have been joined by seven of the hunter's best. Artworks range from sculpted jackets to intricate landscape pictures. Anything that they can think of, they can, and can create, I think the range is endless and the possibilities are endless. The Seventh-day Adventist-owned sanitarium company has its largest factory in Kurumbong. The new 25,000 square metre plant in Berkeley Vale will be even bigger. It's the company's eighth factory in Australia and New Zealand and will manufacture sanitarium's famous wheat bix breakfast food and so good soy drink products, as well as taking over canning operations from Kurumbong. The 15-hectare site was sold by Wang Shire Council to the company for twice as much as it paid back in December last year. Part of that profit will go towards continuing council policy of attracting more industry in a bid to help the local economy and cut high unemployment. It certainly has traditionally. It has suffered far worse than the uh, federal average for unemployment. So industrial development of this nature is certainly playing an important role in overcoming that problem for uh, particularly our young people of our area. Well obviously we'll need to bring in some people who have skills and experience uh, to form a core for such a new development. 
But I would think of the 250 to 300 people we would expect to employ once the plant is fully commissioned, something approaching 200 will need to be recruited from this area. The factory has the potential to expand by 100%. Building is expected to be underway before the end of the year with a mid-1992 opening. This brings the total of new industry in the Shire to more than $1 billion worth. This includes Master Foods due to begin operations in December next year, Procter & Gamble due to open in October this year with plans for an $80 million Stage 2 expansion, Sunny Bright Foods due to open in February this year and Framex which set up last November. Almost 60 people were reported missing to police in the Hunter region this year alone. So far, 43 have been located. Most on the police missing persons files are teenagers, many just 13 or 14 years old. This is Missing Persons Week and Newcastle Police have put together a display wall of just a few of those people which they're exhibiting at Garden City in Katara. But they say the easiest way to close their files is through a simple phone call. If they've left the home in a, in a rational state after an argument, it's quite possible that they, um, after a period of time, haven't realised that the family have reported them missing to the police. Uh, if somebody has done that, then naturally we'll be requesting them to go to a police station or just give us a call. And today, police launched Operation Phone Home. People who've been out of touch with family or friends for any length of time can dial 008 025 091 and let police know that they are at least alive and out of danger. Police stress that a missing person hasn't committed a crime and the call is confidential. They don't have to tell us where they are or what they're doing, simply that they're OK and that they're, they're out by themselves of their own free will. There are cases police doubt will be solved by a phone call. Some local faces have haunted them for years. Among them, Leanne Goodall disappeared, aged 20 in 1978, last seen boarding a train at Musselbrook. Or Debbie Pritchard, last seen at a Newcastle nightclub in 1982, the 24-year-old hasn't been seen since. Or Amanda Robinson, only 14 when she disappeared from a bus stop at Swansea in 1979. 16-year-old Amanda Zolas disappeared in 1979 after a telephone call to her father. For the families of all these missing girls, life has been a limbo of uncertainty. All police need to end the despair of those and other families is a phone call. After that, the no longer missing person can still walk out of their lives, at least leaving one mystery solved. Tom Hilston, NBN News. The Hunter Valley was spared much of the coastal battering and for once relieved SES volunteers could watch serious flooding in other parts of the state while the expected local crisis failed to develop. However, floodwaters have cut several roads. The most disruptive closure was at Testers Hollow. Commuters and holiday makers attempting to reach Maitland from Curry now face a lengthy detour. Elsewhere, flooding was spectacular, but the impact was on smaller communities. The torrent running over Melville Ford, north of Rutherford, is one of many which won't abate for days. SES volunteers weren't idle. From early this morning, they answered hundreds of calls for assistance, mostly from houses in urgent need of tarpaulins. The SES maintained a round-the-clock vigil on flooding reports in the Lower Hunter headquarters at East Maitland. Division controller Jim Chadban says information from the public has supplemented patchy weather details. At the moment we're sitting on tender hooks because the uh, Weather Bureau can't give us any accurate information. The rain at the moment is falling right across the catchment. Overnight we've had extremely heavy rains in the north of Dungog in the forests. There's no, river, no rainfall gauges there and a similar situation for the Wallenby Brook down behind Murray's Run. So by, by and large we're flying by the seat of our pants and by local reports and they have proved most accurate at this stage. Late this afternoon, the first flood boat was readied to carry emergency supplies to stranded properties at Laguna to the southwest of Cessnock. Other boats were being prepared, but the SES says so far, no one is in urgent need of assistance.
Thank you. Thank you. Here we go. Say happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. That's not. That's a cat. What? Happy birthday, Bob. Happy birthday, Bob. I can't move from here. Yeah. Here we go. Sing happy birthday. Happy birthday. Not his sword hand. It's Gordon. Happy, happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you.